This is the third one of these I've done responding to vegan critics. I think it's the third one. Yeah, responding to vegan critics, uh, vegan YouTubers who have been critical of me have made like videos about me trying to, I don't know, just see more videos, more people, um, kind of focusing more on smaller channels. I am keeping the same rules channel needs to have at least a thousand subs, video at least a thousand views, and it has to be a channel that I haven't engaged with in the past. And yeah, I'm keeping this one to one person, obviously, to Goji Man and his video about me and Christina, because the other two were like, wasn't one 40 minutes long, I think. So I wanted to do one that like, just wasn't super long. And this is one that a lot of you guys asked for. Also the same strike system, sort of three strikes you're out type deal. So if they are making logical fallacies, if they are misrepresenting me, if they are presenting empirical claims, claims that can be verified empirically that are false, just saying like, uh, cashews are bad. <laughs> that may, um, sound familiar. Yeah, if they're just like, cashews are bad anyway, that's gonna be a strike. Like I said, Goji Man, Unnatural Vegan, and Christina's opinions on depression will baffle you. This is from last year, I think, late last year, and it's responding to my video, Christina eating raw and getting a tan didn't fix my depression from two years ago. Crazy. He starts out the video with this disclaimer, which is often a red flag, at least in certain contexts. Actual medical professionals do use something similar, at least sometimes, but these sources are usually providing evidence-based information and pretty generalized information, right? You aren't going to see recommendations based on speculative hypotheses or encouraging people to take certain supplements or certain foods other than like eat fruits and vegetables. <laughs> now in this context, a medical disclaimer is really a way for non-medical professionals to give what any reasonable person would take to be personal medical advice and pretend they aren't liable for it. Or to present speculative information as evidence-based and like clearly something people should follow, but then be able to say, well, my information here was purely for educational purposes. Like you should have spoken to your doctors. People often use something like this when they're about to sell you a bunch of pseudoscience, a bunch of garbage in the name of health. Or if it's like a supplement, you'll see the these statements have not been uh, evaluated by the FDA, aka the quack Miranda warning. You'll see these everywhere on AltMed websites in an attempt to fend off suit from the FDA. Now I'm not saying that the FDA is like at all interested in a YouTuber like Goji Man. He's not American anyway. I'm just pointing out a trend that like anyone familiar with alternative medicine has seen these medical disclaimers coupled with people lacking any sort of relevant medical expertise spouting really at best hypotheses and at worst like dangerous information or even, you know, encouraging supplement use or selling supplements and other bullshit products. Uh, yeah, this video from Goji Man is definitely an example of that, as we will see, like, right after this disclaimer, just in the first, like, 40 seconds of the video. Before I jump into the video, just a quick reminder that I'm now offering the SIBO, organic acids, stool tests, and consults via my website. So if you have any health or digestive problems, then consider taking these tests, as they will provide a lot of very detailed information upon which you can start making informed decisions and then start getting your health back on track. Even though that wasn't a critique of anything that I said, I'm gonna give it a strike. He's ultimately saying that these tests will help you get healthy with no evidence, no attempt to prove that whatsoever. These tests he's talking about, the SIBO breath test, stool test, and organic acids urine test, these are legitimate tests that doctors use, but doctors do not use them for the range of issues that Goji Man says they are appropriate for. A doctor is not gonna order these tests just because you have health or digestive problems. So if you have any health or digestive problems and consider taking these tests. Which I love how vague that is. Like not just digestive problems, which is already covering a lot, covering a lot of ground, right? But just health problems. Like so so any anything, <laughs> literally anything these tests can help with. And he says the same exact thing in other videos too. So if you have any health or digestive problems then consider taking these tests as they will provide a lot of very detailed information upon which you can start making informed decisions and then start getting your health back on track. Yeah, if you've got any sort of health problems, buy these tests. Sounds pretty lucrative. 
Anyway, take the uh, organic acids test. Again, this is a urine test. It's used for really one purpose, to diagnose what's called inborn errors of metabolism. It's a buildup of organic acids in the body. This typically becomes apparent and the, the screening is called for like early on in a person's life, like early infancy, like newborn baby time. This is all according to Mayo Clinic Laboratories and other reputable sources. According to Goji Man, this test is appropriate for like anyone and everyone. So if you have any health or digestive problems, as long as you got the cash, as long as you have 245 pounds or $320 just for this one test. By the way, he offers this test via Great Plains Laboratory. It's one of the bigger direct consumer lab testing companies. They offer an autism panel. So, you know, that's what you're supporting by supporting Goji Man via this, this test, if you purchase this test through Goji Man, you know, just FYI. Similar thing with the comprehensive stool test. Doctors use this to help diagnose various conditions. Goji Man uses it to detect yeast. Beware of stool tests that include specific commentary about your levels of a much maligned yeast called candida, namely whether you have too much of it. In reality, virtually every human being harbors this nearly ubiquitous yeast in his or her stool, and there's no standard reference range for a normal level of it. Therefore, having too much of it is an arbitrary designation often used as a pretense to sell you a probiotic or antifungal supplement regimen. To his credit, Goji Man doesn't appear to sell any uh, supplements or um, any sort of treatment via his website. Now, again, with the organic acid test that is through Great Plains, they do, and he seems to take the their copy, like just directly from their website and use that on his, and it does mention like treatment, including supplements. But yeah, his shop does not include just a host of, of supplements that you're supposed to take, which I was, I was pretty surprised by, gotta say. So yes, these tests do offer information, but it's not the kind of meaningful information that you can really make informed decisions on. Maybe one day they will, and then, you know, actual doctors and actual clinics will, will use them, right? But they don't yet. So selling these tests now with the promise that they'll help people, you know, get their health back on track is totally unethical. And just as another FYI, Goji Man is not an MD. He describes himself as a qualified nutritionist in his banner. On his about page on YouTube, it states that he's like currently studying for a master's degree of science in food, nutrition, and health. This is offered at University College Dublin. It's an online course. So even if he goes through all of this, or maybe he has already, maybe the about page isn't up to date, that doesn't make him a dietitian. Dietitian and nutritionists are very different in the UK as well as here in the US. In the UK, only those who are registered can call themselves a dietitian. It is a you know title that's protected by law. Their schooling includes clinical experience. And then there are nutritionists. This is not a protected title. Some are registered, and so they're called registered nutritionists. And then kind of under that, there are nutritional therapists who are not registered. This seems to be where Goji Man falls. Nutritional therapists use treatments such as high-dose vitamins, detox, and food avoidance for which there is little robust scientific evidence. They work on the belief that the body has underlying nutritional and biochemical imbalances that lead to poor health, including mental health problems. They do not use the evidence in a robust fashion, and advice is most most often based on personal opinion or belief. So if you have any health or digestive problems and consider taking these tests. Sound familiar? So that was strike one. Again, didn't really have anything to do with anything I said, but it is, um, I think it says a lot about where he is coming from and whether or not he should really be trusted as a nutrition or as a, a health uh, professional. But there is more and spoiler, it does not get better. If you're consuming processed junk foods all day, there are additives and chemicals in there that are designed to make you feel depressed. Source? Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure additives and preservatives, whatnot, are used to, like, preserve food. So, yes, I definitely agree with Unnatural Vegan that the idea that preservatives are added to foods to deliberately make you depressed is absolutely ridiculous. Cool is what I said to myself when I first watched this video. <laughs> like, hey, maybe he's more reasonable than I assumed he was, given that little intro. That being said, the purpose of preservatives is to stop a food degrading as quickly on a supermarket shelf. Obviously, if you put a compound into your gut that doesn't want to be broken down and your digestive system has been designed to break food down, then there is always the potential for a conflict of interest. Spoke too soon. 
Strike number two for not understanding how digestion works. First, the compounds aren't designed to not break down. They're designed to prevent food from spoiling, to completely different things. The mark of a good and safe preservative is often that it can be broken down by human metabolism, either that or that it just isn't absorbed at all. For example, one of the most common preservatives, sulfite salts like potassium bisulfite, disassociate into their respective ions. The body can then use sulfite oxidase, an enzyme, to quickly metabolize the sulfite that is absorbed into sulfate, which is later excreted. What makes it a great preservative is that many of the organisms that cause food to spoil are really bad at breaking it down or they don't have the resources to break it down. And in relatively high concentrations, it can actually slow bacterial growth by interfering with cellular function. It's a fundamental difference between many bacterium and eukaryotes like us. You don't really have to understand the chemistry to understand that we work differently and that things that are a problem for microbes are typically benign for us, unless there is some sort of deficiency in enzymes, some like genetic deficiency in enzymes that break it down or an allergic response. Second, there's not necessarily any conflict of interest, as he says, um, if you eat something that you can't break down. This is common of many fibers, also in people with pica. If nothing breaks it down, it just passes through, and as long as it's not toxic, it's typically benign. The real problem is if you eat like too much to the point where you become physically compacted and it can't pass through and other things can't pass through either, or if you eat so much that you become nutrient deficient. Now there could be a conflict of interest if something is like specifically designed to impede digestion, like it binds to digestive enzymes or it neutralizes stomach acid. Of course, Goji Man thinks digestion is primarily done by microbes. And so anything that prevents microbial replication is going to prevent you from digesting your food. He talks about sulfites and sulfite sensitivity, which is a thing. And then he says this sensitivity is linked to depression. There are also many people who report significant depressive and psychotic episodes after the ingestion of sodium sulfite and certain other additives and preservatives. So I certainly don't believe it's beyond the realms of possibility that these types of preservatives could be a root cause of depression in some. I appreciate him saying, you know, many people report that this is a thing, that they have this experience after consuming sulfites. In other words, anecdotes, but he still implies the link is legitimate simply because it appears to happen to a lot of people. Do you know what else people thought were legitimate because it appeared to happen to a lot of people? Headaches and MSG. And then science happened. <laughs> so the link between sulfite and depression could be real. It could not be real, just like the link between MSG and Chinese restaurant syndrome. It could just be the nocebo effect. We don't know. There's also some evidence that a few people have lower levels of the uh, sulfite oxidase, the enzyme that I mentioned earlier. It wouldn't be entirely surprising that having this sort of reaction to common foods would be depressing. But again, this doesn't mean the association is definitely for real, association between sulfite and depression. And also this doesn't have anything to do with sulfite's function as a preservative. So I think what is probably happening in these people is that if they are consuming higher amounts of foods containing preservatives such as sulfites, then it can inhibit the growth of beneficial gut flora. Then if the diversity isn't what it should be in the gut, then there is every chance that the short chain fatty acid production in the gut could be diminished. So I really want to give him a strike for this, but he did qualify it with, I think, so no strike. The reaction to sulfites is rapid onset, so minutes, not hours or days. The effects are fast because it is being broken down and absorbed, like most salts. Some of it is likely even being inhaled, resulting in like an immediate response. This indicates an allergic reaction or some sort of effect um, on the lungs from the gas, not some long-term effect caused by a disruption of the microbiome. But let's look at the study that he screenshots anyway. No link in the description, just links to buy his tests. Shocking. So it turns out the effect they found with sulfites, the concentration was at least 250 parts per million. So this is a considerably higher required concentration than can set off allergic reactions. The FDA sets the threshold for declaration at 10 parts per million because below that there's no evidence of allergic reaction. Foods above 100 parts per million are typically considered high sulfite foods, so certain dried fruits. Few foods other than dried fruits have levels above 250 parts per million. To achieve that 
like level or that that average concentration anywhere in your digestive system, you would have to be consuming almost exclusively like high sulfite foods and high sulfite beverages too. And wine would not be enough. Uh, most of that seems to be under 200. Now, obviously most people do not eat like that. The total daily per capita intake of sulfites for foods is approximately six milligrams. In two kilograms of food, which is about the average, about how much people eat, that's only three parts per million. Nearly 100 times less than is required for an effect on the microbiome, according to this study. And that would be further diluted by most beverages, so adding another kilogram or, or so, so now we're down to two parts per million. Also, to achieve that concentration in the part of your body, the part of your digestive tract where the microbiome is relevant, you would have to consume more, a higher concentration to make up for the percentage that your body absorbs. The real question is not how much sulfite is required to inhibit microbial growth, it's how much actually gets past the stomach. It's a question the study doesn't seem to answer, and without that, it doesn't really have much, if any, real-world relevance, even if people were routinely consuming those kinds of concentrations, which they clearly aren't. So when you eat fiber, fiber is fermented in the gut to produce short-chain fatty acids such as acetate, propionate, and butyrate. These short-chain fatty acids then get flipped in the body to become neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. It's funny because propionate is actually used as a preservative. <laughs> and he says that by eating preservatives, he thinks we're not getting enough propionate. Okay. Acetate, acetic acid, vinegar, also a preservative. Butyrate or butyric acid is the most studied because it's the most likely to have a significant effect from gut production. Research so far is a little inconsistent as to whether it reverses or promotes obesity and insulin insensitivity. Regardless, the obvious effects of short chain fatty acid production seem isolated to the gut where they're predominantly used as a source of energy. The flipped comment he makes. These short chain fatty acids then get flipped in the body to become neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. I'm not gonna give him a strike for that because it's, it's pretty vague. I think he's probably referring to studies like this. Produced and used locally, it seems people forget or they don't understand that different chemical signals are used for totally different purposes by different bodily organs. Even if the colon systemically releases it, serotonin does not cross the blood-brain barrier. There are signal pathways from the gut that affect appetite, but that has nothing to do with the claims Goji Man is making. Serotonin, as it relates to depression, has to be synthesized in the brain, and it's not synthesized from short-chain fatty acids, it's made from L-tryptophan, an amino acid. Same for dopamine and epinephrine. So when we're talking about short chain fatty acids, we're talking about, again, a source of energy and possibly chemicals that alter gene expression via various receptors in ways that, you know, people much smarter than me are just beginning to research. Now, short chain fatty acids do cross the blood brain barrier, but research into the effects of things like butyrate on depression is very preliminary. There's very little evidence for significant differences in short chain fatty acids between depressed and non-depressed subjects. But remember, it's correlation, not causation, that lower levels of these transmitters can induce anxiety, depression, and sleep issues in some people. It's correlation, not causation, that short-chain fatty acid production or ratios has anything to do with them to begin with. He's, he's got it totally backwards. He's acting as though like the link to the microbiome is certain, but we don't know anything about the, you know, neurotransmitter depression link, which is, it's, it's very silly. There's a whole hell of a lot more evidence for SSRIs. And there will be those whose gut flora diversity will be stifled by these type of preservatives, making it more difficult for them to produce the so-called happy hormones. That was definitely a matter of fact claim. So strike number three. I'll conclude by saying, like, please be careful trusting people like this. You know, he speaks quickly and confidently. He uses a lot of big words. Um, he has an accent, which is just, it matters for Americans. We think you're smarter. <laughs> it's a thing. He has like kind of relevant credentials, but ultimately he is selling you these tests. He's making money on you believing that these tests and his interpretation of the tests can provide you important information that will help you 
get your health on track or whatever he says. I understand it's hard. You know, you, people want this to be the answer. They want just s some kind of answer. You know, if you're dealing with um, serious digestive problems or, or mental health issues, but it's important to remember that if there was good evidence for this, it, it wouldn't be relegated to alt med fringe. It would, it would just be medicine or would be in the process of becoming medicine and be becoming like standard practice. Obviously these things take time because science is important. Evidence is important. Now that doesn't mean doctors are perfect. It doesn't mean that doctors don't get stuff wrong. It doesn't mean there aren't horrible doctors, doctors who don't listen, who misdiagnose, who just don't care. It doesn't mean that there aren't good doctors who can't help you know, if, if it's a, a condition that's unknown, the cause is unknown, or it's a condition that just can't be treated yet by medicine. Medicine just hasn't progressed far enough to help. But it's ultimately an issue of probability. What is our chance of receiving evidence-based information? Is it higher with actual doctors or with nutritionists on YouTube who apparently support anti-vax talking points, including the MMR autism link that does not exist, and disbelief in germ theory? I think I'll take my chances with Big Pharma. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And I will have a new video soon, possibly another one of these soon. I feel like I should do something fun. I don't know, leave your suggestions, video suggestions in the comments. I will try to remember that I asked that. So, <laughs> so or demanded that, I guess. I didn't really ask it. Leave, leave them, leave the suggestions. Uh, I'll try to remember that I demanded that. And so I actually read the comments. <laughs> I'll try. I should read the comments to this one. There might be some good ones. I, I kind of like, you know, depends on what the video is. Sometimes I read comments, sometimes I don't. I mean, obviously if it becomes very controversial, like with the Black Lives Matter stuff, I read a lot of those comments because, you know, want to make sure I'm not wrong or, you know, want to learn something, right? Uh, but yeah, with a lot of stuff, I don't. Just, like, I'm not going to read the comments on the what I've learned one. I mean, I've seen a few and most of them have just been like, yeah, this was crazy. Or like, yeah, I used to be a fan of this guy, but it's like, what, the nutrition stuff? Like, what is this? Um... Yeah, but I, I don't really want to read like carnivore shit, you know, because that's coming. You know, that's coming. If it's not there already, it might be. There's only so much time in the day. Again, probability, like what's what's the likelihood you're actually going to gain anything from this? You know, it's like it's like learning about physics or, or just the world in general or gravity or anything like that from a flat earther hmm. or learning about like really anything to do with health from an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> like, may maybe it makes more sense to just, like, ignore those sources. It's responding to my video. What, what video is it even? I have to look this up. Oh yeah, that one's demonetized. That's so weird. Why is that one demonetized? Hey, that's something good that YouTube has done. They have this self-certification system now that they've had in place now for um, two or three months, I think for, I don't know if it's for everyone, but I have it. Mm. And basically when you are, you know, uploading your video and it's like, do you want to monetize it? Yes. And it's like, okay, tell us about the video. And it goes through all of the ad friendly guidelines, like profanity, tobacco use, firearms, uh, controversial stuff, hate crimes, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, Hey, is this in your video? And so for me, again, I've had this for two or three months now. And so every video I got that and it asked me to do a little check and to put like, okay, there's light profanity in this. And like, oh, this covers, uh, you know, this talks about COVID-19, whatever. And then it'll tell you like, okay, this can be monetized or no, this can not be monetized. And so after this two or three months, just very recently, YouTube was like, hey, you have like correctly identified your your shit in every single case one of my videos like every single one has light profanity and then i think one had like you know oh it talks about controversial stuff covid19 it still let me monetize which was cool uh but yeah they were like hey every single one has been right because you do the self-certification and then youtube will go through it you know they do the automated system and then i don't know if they did a manual review as well i'm not exactly sure how that worked but anyway i got a notification like a few weeks ago that was like hey now we will just trust you basically like whatever you say 
say if it's supposed to be monetized or not. We'll just trust you. And then if there's any reason to doubt that, which I guess, I don't know if they're looking at comments or if a lot of people are reporting the video, something like that, then they'll look into it and be like, oh, hey, you were wrong about this. Maybe we'll go back to, you know, not using the, the self-certification or whatever. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that because I'm, I kind of rag on YouTube a lot. And I think this is a really positive change, a good change for creators. And also they have a pending on monetization. So it used to be, I would put a video up and it would say green, it's monetized, but really it's still going through the automated thing that the automated system runs through the video, you know, looking at the audio and the visuals and everything and does that multiple times. And I don't know when it's done doing that or not. So, you know, I've had times where I put a video up on YouTube and then hours later it's like oh no now it's now it's yellow it's you know not safe for most advertisers which is fine I don't care about that part it's just the like not knowing <laughs> like not knowing if it's going to change and like what's going on so again for just a little bit now they've had the pending status so it says pending and then once it turns to green or yellow that's pretty much guaranteed that that's where it's going to stay unless you appeal the yellow. And then once it's appealed, that's it. You don't get any, any more um, manual review. They've had that in place for a while, but yeah, the pending thing is new, which is really cool. So just wanted to mention that, that YouTube does some, some good stuff sometimes, you know? And I know everyone hates the new YouTube studio. Um, I don't know, I think it's fine. But then again, I don't, I think a lot of the problems people have, it has to do with analytics and, and kind of what's available and where it is. And I don't like use analytics. Like I look at it like, you know, how many views did I do? How much money? Oh, okay. This month was different than the other month. I don't know why it's just ad rates. Who knows? <laughs> it just happens. You know, I just know that like in the winter dollar per view basically is going to go up because Christmas time, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I don't look into like demographics or anything like that. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. Like what, what's that going to tell me? Okay. Most of my viewers are women. Duh. Point is, this video was demonetized a long time ago. I wonder if I were to upload it today and say, yo, this is fine, if they'd be like, yeah, it's, it's fine. Well, I guess they wouldn't check it. So then someone would have to, eh, whatever. It doesn't matter. And I think this was, this wasn't, right, this one wasn't initially yellow. It was green for a long time. And I think I just saw that it was yellow, like maybe a couple months ago. I mean, I published this two years ago, June? Holy crap, June of 2018. So yeah, uh, yeah, I think it was like a few months ago. I was like, oh, it's yellow for some reason. So again, that's like years after it was published. It's so strange. But like I said, they've they've like changed the whole system. So I don't even know if that's like still happening with channels. I don't know. But uh, yeah, anyway, just wanted to mention that. It's, it's, it's a good change, I think.